Before I introduce you to my next guest today, I want to make sure that you're aware of two new resources to help you to increase your productivity, clarify your purpose, and improve your communication skills. The first one is our Facebook community called Leadership with Purpose. So it's a private community. So go to Facebook groups, search for Leadership with Purpose, and send a request to be invited into the group. There's a few questions for you to answer, and then live to have you a part of that community of other like-minded leaders. Our team is really excited about launching the Next Level Coaching Roadmap. It's a group coaching format, so highly recommend that you check that out and to get your questions answered. If you're a leader that's experiencing any of the following, this is definitely a group format that's going to help you break through to your next level within leadership and your career. So if you have any fear about moving to the next level in your leadership career, this is a group that you'll want to connect with. If you have loss of confidence, if you're kind of confused, like not knowing really how to tap into the hidden job market, if you have a desire to really to grow to the next level, this is definitely a group that you'll want to be able to, to connect with. If you want to know how to stay calm in a high stress environment, there's going to be strategies, tips, and resources, conversations all around how to develop um, skills to do just that. So if you want more information, head over to warrenwandling.com slash the next level coaching. And uh, in there on that page, you'll notice uh, more information about the coaching roadmap, but also there's a link for you to schedule a phone call with me so we can help um, really figure out if this is the right fit to helping you take your career to the next level. Again, that's warrenwandling.com slash the next level coaching. Welcome back to another episode of How to Become an Obstacle Buster. I'm your host, Warren Wandling, the show that's dedicated helping leaders, entrepreneurs to overcome their obstacles, build resilience, and achieve success. And today I have a great guest with me to do just that, Aurora Winter. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's so great to be on the show with you, Warren, and I look forward to helping your audience turn their obstacles into their next business. Yes, I'm really looking forward to our conversation as well. Uh, as a TV producer, media coach, best-selling author, successful serial entrepreneur, tell us about your business. Well, right now, I just love helping entrepreneurs, leaders, and experts write and publish their books. That's specifically what I am focused on primarily because 80% of people want to write a book, but the obstacle that they encounter is... On average, first-time authors spend three and a half years figuring out their message. So I thought I would solve that problem for, for other people because I love books. I'm a book nerd. But that's one thing I'd really love people to think about as they're listening to this great podcast, How to Be an Obstacle Buster, is you know whatever obstacles you may be facing, once you discover how to overcome those obstacles, that may be the secret sauce that you provide to your clients or your patients or your customers as you help them bust through their obstacles more quickly. Wow, that's really interesting. Did you say three and a half years it three takes? Three and a half years is the average it takes a first-time author to, to write their book. And that's not the only problem. The typical first-time author, after struggling for three and a half years to get their manuscript just so, you know, presses, uploads their book to Amazon because they've got great print-on-demand services, and then they press publish, and then nothing happens. Right. Just <laughs> and nothing crickets. happens because they haven't built in and they haven't thought through what is the marketing plan, what, how are we going to lead up and create buzz for the book. So I help people with that. And then the third thing that I love helping people with, because I'm a serial entrepreneur, as you mentioned, Warren, as I love helping people think through, hey, once people have read your book, a book solves a problem, a nonfiction book typically solves a problem. So once they've solved that problem, what is the next problem that they're facing? And would you be willing to solve that problem for them? Because the other mistake that people make, not only first time authors, and not only with their first books, is they fail to consider, well, after the person's finished reading the book, how can I serve them further? Can I invite them to take my training or join my Facebook group? Or maybe they'd like, you know, VIP done with you solutions or done for you, white glove solutions. I mean, you're really good at that, Warren. The um, 
episodes of your podcast I listen to invite people to take advantage of the additional resources that you provide. So you're adding more value. So the other way that people fail to really serve their readers is they don't think through, well, okay, what ne- what next? <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. So is the, what, what out of those three, because you'd mentioned some great areas to focus on, right? Not only to publish the manuscript, but the solving the problem, if it's the marketing and creating the, the buzz. Um, what is the greatest obstacle that your clients encounter? Well, honestly, Warren, I think it's the imposter syndrome. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of people think, you know, who am I? What have I got to offer? Who wants to listen to me? But the truth is everybody who is some kind of expert, who is a professional, who has a a successful business, they have something to offer. And one of the things that everyone has to offer is exactly what your podcast is about. What are the obstacles that you have faced? How did you overcome them? And can you help other people overcome similar obstacles? Of course you can. So I love to really help people write books that share their obstacles, their problems, their challenges, even their heartbreak, and how they manage to bust through those obstacles, release that stress, bounce back with resilience, and solve their problems. And, and that is the biggest gift we have to give other people. All we have to share with other people is our own stories. And you own your stories. You are the only person who has your stories. So I love to help people put their, put their stories into, into videos, into their pitch to raise capital, into their books, and to lean into that offering who you are to the world is actually the biggest gift you have to offer. Wow, that's I love that that connection in reference to right helping to eliminate the imposter syndrome, right? That they do have something because they have a unique story that no one else does because it's their story to be able to share that with the world. So with is there a strategy that you work with your clients to help them really break through that imposter syndrome? <sighs> Well, the, 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 the biggest strategy I use that people can learn right here, right now is to stop thinking about yourself. Yes. What if it's not about you? When you focus on your reader or your audience, your listener, the person who's watching your videos on YouTube, and you think about that person, then all of a sudden your self-consciousness will melt away. So consider how you can be a service to others and imagine that somebody is praying for you to provide the answer and also consider you know how much pain were you in when you were dealing with you know uh, perhaps your business was on the verge of bankruptcy maybe like me you dealt with your spouse dying right in front of you when you only had a four-year-old son consider how much pain you were in and if you can provide a bridge so that others can overcome major adversity more quickly then you're being a real gift. Well, that is so powerful, right? To make sure that it's that it's not about you. So when you were building your business, what were some of the strategies that really contributed to help you to be successful building your businesses? Well, making a lot of mistakes quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? That's called experience, right? Exactly. Well, I do want to share a quick little story uh, that I believe will encourage all of the, the listeners so in, um, in 2014, 2015, I, I basically closed the doors on my then business. I was the founder of the Grief Coach Academy, and I was training coaches and other caring people how to help people through grief. But by 2014, I'd hit a wall. I didn't want the rest of my life to be about grief. And even though it was very satisfying to do what I did, I felt like, okay, I've, I've, I've written that book. I've, I've provided value. I've helped a bunch of people. Now what? So I took about two years off to get my MBA, went to Italy and and took it through the University of Iowa at Chimba. So that was kind of cool. Got to visit Venice quite a bit. And I'm not talking about Venice Beach. I'm talking about Venice, Italy. So, but fast forward, I graduated with my, um, my fancy smancy MBA. And then I'm like, okay, now what? 
do I get a job? Like, yeah, right. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. What do I want to do? Well, I liked helping people with their marketing and messaging. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I got an MBA, because I thought if I'm going to be helping business owners and entrepreneurs with their marketing and messaging, it better go hand in glove with their business plan and better better make all financial sense. So, but I had a business problem. I had a cash flow problem. There was no cash flowing. That was a problem. So what I did is I took a one hour interview that I had previously done. The director of coaching for Tony Robbins had interviewed me about marketing. I liked the interview and I quickly turned that one hour interview into a really short little book, which is basically the interview plus an introduction plus a call to action. And I launched that book. I offered the book for free, actually, um, but people just paid a couple of dollars for shipping and handling, which meant that it was more or less a break even for me after printing costs. And I offered that book to my relatively small list of 12,000 people who knew me as the trainer of the Grief Coach Academy. So these were not people who were looking, oh, Aurora is my marketing mentor and she's going to help me with my message or help me publish my book. That, That was not how they knew me. Um, And the result was that that little book, which is titled Marketing Fast Track, the little book that launched a new business, actually generated $250,000 of new business in 90 days. I was like, I was completely blown away. I want to be clear. It wasn't $250,000 from book sales. Again, I gave the book away for free. People just paid for shipping and handling. And But it brought people to me who wanted help with their marketing, wanted help with their messaging. Some of them wanted, you know, the white glove service where I help them create, publish and promote their book and launch as thought leaders. And so I just actually published that book. Uh, the second edition just published yesterday, August 17th, 2021. August 17th is my birthday. So I thought I'd remember it because I wanted to add at the introduction, what happened after? <laughs> what happened after was $250,000. Oh, wow. well, happy birthday. Thank you so much, Warren. Yeah. But I wanted that book to let people know, you know what? Yes, you may at some point want to write a New York Times bestselling book, which you probably cannot do in a one hour <laughs> or over the weekend. Yeah. But even a short little book can help you test a business idea. It can help you See if the market is hungry for the product or the service that you want to offer, and it can help you launch something new. So that's why I published Marketing Fast Track, and you'll get to see a book as a minimum viable product for a business. Wow, that's interesting. I love that strategy and ideas. I I guess maybe in, in your opinion, why do you think every expert and entrepreneur leader needs to write a book? Hmm. Well, I think a book is a lot like having an MBA. Most people could, if they wanted to, dig down and do the work and take the time off, they could get an MBA. But very few people do. Mm -hmm. A book is like that for a leader, a thought leader, an expert, or an entrepreneur who wants to set him or herself apart from the competition. A book is intellectual property. It's your it's your brand and and it provides a similar level of credibility to having a master's degree or a terminal degree like a phd also there's so much value in you the author getting clear what you want to say and as you get more and more clear about what you want to say you become magnetic to your ideal client you leverage your time by attracting people, you know, uh, on on scale, at scale. You don't have to talk to every single pe- person who reads your book. And you both attract and repel when you are authentic in what you share. So I believe that you, you hit a ceiling. Maybe it's not the glass ceiling, <laughs> but you hit some <laughs> kind of ceiling as a leader if you don't have a book. You can't get so easily on big TV, on big radio, on the TED stage, on other stages. It's like, mm, no, you don't pass the sniff test. So this is why I recommend that leaders and experts and entrepreneurs spend a bit of time, get your book, get your message down so that you can you can attract and you can leap forward to the next level of, of, uh, of impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? And the uh, the time and effort to be able to take your business to that next level. 
And I love that that you mentioned it repels the audience as well, right? So you weed out those that you really attract, that they really resonate with your message. So you're working with that niche, that target niche um, is so key. So I love that aspect that you'd mentioned. Yeah, most people don't think about repelling, but actually it's a lot like dating. You don't want every possible client. You only want your ideal client so that you can be your best, so that you're not drained while you're doing your work, so that your solution is a perfect fit for them, so that they're in your clients, your your patients, your customers are like, oh my gosh, Warren is the most amazing guy. I listen to his How to Be an Obstacle Buster um, podcast. You've got to listen to it too. Changed my life. This is the kind of response you want. So in your book or in your videos, any kind of communication, I really advise people to be authentic, to be real, which doesn't mean that you're bleeding in the page, all over the page. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be bleeding all over the page, but (laughs) you want to be you. So for example, I say things like, you know, people are praying uh, for your help. Why do I use that word? It's because I'm quite spiritual. So I attract people who are also spiritual. I give little cues about who I am. And you can Mm -hmm. read more about it in that short little book, Marketing Fast Track, or my um, other book that was published this year, 2021, Turn Words into Wealth, Blueprint for Your Business Brand and Book, goes into much more depth, how to create a million dollar message, seven different ways that you can create seven figure income with a book. And also it's, I think it's really fun because it gives examples of how I've done it, how my clients have done it, and also how um, best-selling authors that you're f- probably familiar with have done it as well, from Richard Branson to Tim Ferriss to David Goggins to Mel Robbins to Ariana Huffington. Uh, gives examples about how the, the rich and famous and the politicians have always taken advantage of ghostwriters and editors and researchers to create their books. Winston Churchill, for example, who who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, he had an army of editors and researchers and secretary and ghostwriter. Hillary Clinton recently published her book, and she has a acknowledgments that go on and on about her whole team. And yet the everyday person like you and like me mm-hmm. don't necessarily realize that thanks to the wonder of the internet and thanks to the beauty of Amazon, Apple Books, Go. Kobo, Google Play, and other uh, book distribution platforms that everyday people like like you and I can take advantage of having a ghostwriter, having a researcher, having somebody proofread the book, having a really great cover designer. And we can pull all of these amazing people uh, together thanks to the power of the internet and various different uh, platforms. Yeah, that's interesting in reference to that list of the tools, right, that are at our resources now. So I'm really curious, um, how do celebrities write 8,000 words per hour? And uh, I guess our, our listeners could also tap into that strategy as well. Is that right? Absolutely. This is another thing I'd really love people to understand. You know, that a typical author who's actually an experienced writer is maybe writing 2,000 words in a day. Well, my experience with my clients, what I do is we create a framework for the book. We decide, you know, what is the, we begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey (laughs) would uh, approve. And then we create a structure for that book. And then they prepare. And then what we do next is like this. It's a podcast-like episode. And I find that my clients can speak about 8,000 words an hour. So they create a messy first draft, if you like, very, very rapidly. A typical business book is maybe 50,000 words. So in just several hours in, you know, over a weekend, we could uh, do interviews or if they'd like once a week for, you know, 10 weeks, something like that. They have all that's needed as the rough first draft of a book. But if I ask those same people who are not writers to write, instead of producing 8,000 words in an hour, Uh, They would maybe produce 500 words a day, painfully, slowly. (laughs) The other benefit of speaking your book rather than writing it is people love a conversational, friendly, authentic tone. And most people speak that way, but they don't necessarily write that way. So I love to encourage people, "You've, you've probably got a book inside you. Maybe you don't know exactly what you want to say. 
why not work with somebody like myself and my team, or perhaps you've got somebody you know who could interview you, get clear what you'd like to talk about, and then have them ask you questions. And then you can transcribe the audio or video interview, and you begin to see, oh, a book is unfolding here. And, you know, how cool is it? to become a published author. It changes your identity. It's something to be proud of for the rest of your life. And it can change lives when people read it. Yeah, I love how you broke through that obstacle, right? In reference to that task, if you will, sitting down to, you know, to pen every word, but to break that down to something that's really easy to be able to record it and then use your team that you'll assemble. And the great thing is they don't have to be on your staff full time, right? You can um, hire those out and identify that team in reference to the editing and all those other features like yourself that can really help leverage somebody to, to really produce their book. Absolutely. And the other key thing that it does, remember earlier, we talked about another problem that people have is after they've written their book, they have not put any thought into, well, how am I going to promote this book? How am I going to create buzz? Where are my uh, Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn short videos, audios and texts to to promote this book and help people know that I'm doing it? Well, the way that I do the um, book launch with people, I call it the revolutionary new spoken author method um, because I turn authors, I create authors. When they're and they're just speaking. So, with the spoken author method, not only do people create a beautiful book that they can be proud of, but we have hours of audio and video that can be sliced and diced to promote the book. And what I recommend is that most people promote your book for three to six months before it comes out so that people are excited to to read your book. So, basically, when people work with me, they get not only a book. Soft cover book, ebook, perhaps a hardcover book, maybe an audio book. But in addition to that, we create at the same time, without any extra work, we're basically creating hundreds of pieces of content that could be sliced and diced and broadcast on various social media platforms like YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great tip, right? In reference to repurposing their material. And I love that you mentioned that that time frame. That was a great, like a um, value bomb that you just dropped um, in reference to three to six months, like the time frame of how much effort that someone needs to spend in reference to promoting their book before they hit that um, and, and launch it. Absolutely. Most people completely skip that step and that's why they're disappointed with how their book does. Sure. Also, I think a book is a lot like a baby. It It's a certain kind of energy. It's a certain character. It's 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 got a life of its own, but like a baby, you need to give it some TLC while it's still, you know, in diapers and while it's just uh, crawling all along the floor. But for example, one of my clients, Wendy, her book is called um, Where's My Joey? It's an illustrated children's book that came out January of this year. And she followed my um, my recommended procedure. And as a result, she has an award-winning book. The book has been honored with multiple awards. Uh, this past week, she promoted the book uh, with the procedure I recommend. And she has almost 6,000 new readers in just one week. And it's a beautiful book. So, that, you know, those are the results that can be achieved with the right process and the right uh, messaging. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum... Uh, another client of mine is a dentist, Dr. Justine and Janice Doan, and I interviewed them, used my MBA to good uh, to good use to really understand the business of dentistry. I'm not a dentist, so what did I know? But anyway, as I came to understand it, I realized that their ideal client was somebody over 40 and that the typical person who goes in to see their dentist may spend a couple of hundred dollars, but somebody who's over 40 can spend many thousands of dollars. They might spend 5000 10000 or $15,000. So in other words, the lifetime value of a, of a new patient who was 40 was much higher than the lifetime value of a new patient who was 20. And yet their advertising was the same as every other dentist. They're based in San Diego, California at A-plus Family Dentistry. 
And it didn't really leverage their wonderful expertise and their very interesting story. So understanding their business more thoroughly and understanding the the profit margin, the book we created that I produced by interviewing them is called Keys to a Healthy Smile After 40. So and their business went from $1.5 to $6 million as a result of really doubling down on the value that they could provide and getting really clear on who their ideal patient was and then uh, setting up their attraction system to attract that person. One more quick thing, and then I really want to hear your comments, Warren, is a lot of us um, don't think about the fact that the most effective marketing funnels combine online and offline. So online is great. You can listen to a podcast, you can watch a video, you can open your email. But the problem with online is that once you close your smartphone or your computer, you can easily forget about it or even where it was. Where did you see that? The beauty of a printed book, a soft cover book or a hardcover book, is it sits on the shelf in the person's home, reminding them about you and your solutions and your products and services. Talking again about those same dentists, Janice and Justine Doan, the book became a wonderful way for their very happy patients to refer their friends. They could just hand them a book and say, hey, these are my dentists, check them out. And so combining online and offline is a really important thing to consider. And there is something about a book. People generally don't throw books away. If you give a book away or if somebody buys a book, they keep it, they honor it. Whereas people throw away business cards and brochures and they forget where the heck those online marketing uh, things were. Plus, when people are on their smartphone or their computer, they're always getting interrupted. Whereas somebody is reading your book, it's a very intimate connection. And uh, most likely you'll get hours and hours of their time without interruption. Yeah, I love that online, offline connection. Um, And certainly raising that awareness of um, building that know, like, and trust with your audience and on their time as they continue to read their book and that ease, I guess, right, of being able to develop a referral network because then that person, as they refer you, right, that kind of just builds that trust like, this is their book and you learn more about them even before you start the conversation of if that's the right, um, like for example, here, the right dentist to, um, to um, have them be part, be your um, dentist. I love that being able to build that trust. Yeah, it's very important. Well, before we started recording, Warren, you were kind enough to indicate that you had started reading my book, Turn Words into Wealth. Mm -hmm. What stood out to you? What did you like about it? Yeah, so I love the idea around, you shared an idea with your readers in the chapter. I think it was called Myths, Words That Don't don't Matter. Um, You share with your readers in that specifically um, of states stating your vision and people want to align with a vision greater than themselves. So like proclaiming your vision. I love that in reference to calling out your reader to be able to proclaim their vision. Um, What is the biggest challenge that leaders or your readers that you um, connect with in proclaiming that vision? Mm, Thanks. That's a good question. I think the biggest challenge is people get so busy living moment to moment, hour to hour, that they don't step back. So I have a 90 day challenge. Everybody can do this and this Mm -hmm. will help people proclaim their vision because it will help them get clear on who they are and what they care about and what really matters to them. So it's a 90 day challenge. And I I wrote about this in my book, Turn Words into Wealth, if you need a reminder, but you should be able to do it just from listening to this podcast. So you do this every day for 90 days, it will change your life and it will help you proclaim your vision as you get more clear about who you are. It's, It's radical reading, radical writing and radical review. For every day for the next 90 days, read something. It could be as little as five minutes, and I urge you to read widely outside of just your area of expertise. So if you don't normally read poetry, read poetry. If you don't normally read short stories, try some of those. If you don't normally read science fiction or fantasy, but that's something you enjoyed as a kid, pick up some some, uh, sci-fi or fantasy. 
So read every day, just for five minutes, maybe just before you fall asleep um, at night. Second thing, write every day. Again, it can be as little as five minutes, and I would recommend you do this first thing in the morning. So journal, write about yeah. what happened yesterday, write about whatever is on top of mind. This is just for you. You're not writing a book. You are just talking to yourself. We fail to become all that we can be when we don't talk to ourselves and we don't listen to ourselves. So write every day. And then the third one, and this is the one that'll really make the difference, is review. So once a week, quickly review what impact did it make, the things that you read, and quickly review what you've written in your journal. And I promise you, if you do this for 90 days, you will start to notice your life transforming. When I did this after my husband died suddenly, I was feeling, as you can probably imagine, (laughs) pretty blue. I felt like God had abandoned me and I didn't even know if life had any meaning anymore. But I had a really important reason to figure this out because I had a four-year-old looking up at me with trusting eyes, figuring mommy's going to solve this problem. Mommy's going to take care of me and make everything okay again. And as I wrote in my diary, you know, I asked for things. I said, you know, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to survive? My husband was my business partner as well as my best friend and as well as the father of our son. So I had some big problems and I didn't feel like God had my back or I felt like I lived in a universe that was conspiring to trip me up. Hmm. But after I reviewed what I had been writing in my diary, I started to notice that one day I would write, hey, I really need a job. Hey, how am I going to find one? Hey, how am I going to get somebody to look after my son at least once a week so that I don't want to throttle him because I need a little (laughs) downtime? And not the next day, but, you know, weeks later or maybe a month or two later, the answers would come and they would come with ease and grace. They would come with surprising solutions. They would come with people just knocking at my door. I mean, just out of the blue, a woman knocked at my door. She's like, oh, I hear you're new in the neighborhood. I hear your your husband died. I'm like, come on in for a cup of tea. And uh, she came in for a cup of tea. And my husband, who had been my my son, who had been like a cling, cling on to me, he had been Velcroed to me after my husband died. He went and played with her son uh, up in his room, which was in the the attic, two floors Mm -hmm. above. I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. He he, he hasn't gone out of my uh, gone out of my sight. And anyway, as I talked to the other young woman who had just knocked on my door with her with her son and her dog accompanying her, we found out that our sons had gone to daycare together a hundred miles away because we had both lived in Whistler, a ski resort in Whistler. Uh, in in British Columbia, Canada, we had lived there. And she became um, a great help to me. I became a great help to her because she was a teacher. So I looked after her son after he came home from school before she got home. And her son made my son's life so much better because he, he kind of made it normal. She also had experienced the death of her husband, but two years earlier. So she wasn't so raw. And so this question, how am I going to make my son not stick to me like Velcro and be okay, was answered by somebody coming and actually knocking on my door. I uh, turned out to be a young widow and her son turned out to be someone my son had already played with over a hundred miles away. So if you do this and you, you read every day, you write every day, and then you review once a week, you will gradually come to know who you are, what you care about, and you will come to see how you live in a supportive universe. And you will come to take action on those things that really matter to you that you haven't been taking action on. Perhaps one of those is writing a book, or perhaps one of them is making friends with your neighbors. (laughs) Who knows what miracles they might bring? How does that land with you, Warren? Yeah, I love that story, right? And rough. I love that story, certainly with your son connecting with the, um, his friend that he already knew and just that connection, right, that took place. But the, the theme that's underneath that is that simple step for that 90-day challenge is to take the discipline because you didn't really, it wasn't an hour that you were writing. It was five minutes. So it was the, a discipline to be able to do something new um, without any expectations, but to go through the process and to see the patterns that 
you start to write and read. And that is the secret, I think, in reference to that process, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. And, you know, it's certainly fine if you write for longer or you read for longer or you review for longer. But I would love people to just do it for five minutes for the first week or two so that you can develop the new habit and not have the idea, oh, it takes two hours when I start reading because you got carried away. <laughs> How about you? Right, Warren? exactly. Can, I, can, yeah. I ch- can I invite you to take this 90-day challenge? Are you willing to read every day, write every day, and review once a week or so? Oh, yes, you bet. I'm really a big journal, um, writing journal. So I write in my journal daily. In fact, I have three different journals that I write in. I have a gratitude journal is one of them. But I love that idea of review. So I, I review, but not necessarily once a week intentionally. And I think they see one of the secrets that you've mentioned is developing that habit, which is we know if we're going to develop a habit, we have to make sure that it's simple, that we know that we're going to do that. And there is that trigger in that process. So it might be leaving out the journal or something that you're going to read next to your bed or on your desk. So when you see that, it triggers you to, to establish that new habit. Oh, thanks for that point, Warren. It's so helpful to have that trigger. So exactly right. Leave the book that you want to read on your pillow so you can't get into the bed without, <laughs> without, without feeling guilty as you move it. And then you'll be tempted to at least follow through on your commitment to yourself to read for five minutes and get yourself a beautiful journal, maybe three, if you follow Warren's example, and a nice pen that you like writing with and put it beside, I don't know, your coffee or tea in the morning. So you're like, oh yeah, got to do my five minute journal. As you've reviewed your own journals, Warren, have you have you uh, been surprised by anything or have you sometimes noticed a pattern or have you, after listening to yourself, so to speak, by writing and then reviewing what you have written, changed anything that you are doing in your business or personal life? Oh, yeah. Yes, definitely without a doubt. There's times in reference to that, just that processing Um, And journaling can give you that freedom to be able to process. There's no judgment there in the journal because you are processing um, to discover how you are, how I'm showing up. One of the things that I've been really focused on um, recently for several years is around emotional intelligence and just being aware is that self-awareness is one of the first steps of EI um, is just to be aware of how you process emotions and to connect them. And one of the best places I find is when you put it on paper in a journal, because then A, it captures that so you can see how you've grown, uh, as well as just inside of how your old self was compared to where you are maybe in 90 days. I love that. So you have three journals, and one of them is a gratitude journal, and gratitude is uh, the, the wonderful mind shift accelerator. Do you mind sharing what is the purpose of the other two journals? Is one of them around emotional intelligence or what What other two journals do you keep? Yes, yeah, so the other journal I keep is um, specifically, it's general, so it's free flowing. So it could be around other topics. So in reference from a faith perspective, it can be around um, different business ideas that I'm working on or research that I would just start journaling based on some insight. Cool. Yeah, I have a whole bunch of different journals. And uh, there's something about writing it down that actually really makes a difference. So that's a good thing to lean into from neuroscience. So what other questions do you have for me, Warren, about turning words into wealth or anything else you'd like to ask? Yeah, I love there's a another concept that you share with your readers in your your new book, the 64 by four rule. Can you share with us um, how that makes an impact? with leaders? Oh, absolutely. I love, love, love this rule. And uh, it's so great. Most people know about the 80-20 rule, which is that, you know, 20% of your activities will produce 80% of your results. But the 64-4 rule takes that to the next level. And basically what it means is if you do the 80-20 rule on the remaining 20% of activities, and you take the 20% of the 20%, the In other words, just the cream of the cream, you will get only 4% of your activities will produce the majority or 64% of your results. Hmm, kind of cool to know because so many of us are working way too many hours, way too many days of the week because we have bought into the myth that it's all about working hard and working long. 
What if it's about working smarter? Question mark. And what if the smartest way you can work is through communicating more effectively? Where's plenty of data to indicate that communicating more effectively is actually the quantum leap forward that you've been looking for. So for example, Steve Jobs, while he was running Apple, he spent three weeks planning and rehearsing his Apple launch talk because so much money was riding on it. And he was a very, very busy man running Apple. He could have had lots of excuses why not to practice for three whole weeks where he would sand, how the um, slides would go, how he would intone, getting the words just right. And it was totally worth it, right? And I found this myself in, in my own life. I mean, once I pitched, I was pitch, uh, I'm a screenwriter, a film and television producer, and I was invited to pitch in front of 600 film and television uh, executives. And in case they missed it, it was also going to be televised. So, um, and that 20 minute pitch changed my life. I became, at least for 15 minutes, I had my fame in the film industry, especially in in Canada, where I'm from. And I went from struggling, like I mentioned before, after my husband died, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a business partner, and I didn't have a husband, but I did have a four-year-old who needed me to take care of things. So I went from anxious desperation to all of a sudden being a little bit famous and a six-figure opportunity as my agent fielded offers on my behalf. And that changed the trajectory of my life and business. I went on to be head of development for Canada's largest feature film and television production company at the time, Atlantis Films. You know, I went to the con TV and film festivals and, and, uh, I had a whole glamorous life. I even walked the red carpet on the Oscars. And none of that would have happened if it hadn't been for that one 20-minute pitch, which, by the way, was later used to teach the art of pitching at the Banff Film School. So what is the lesson for everyone? It's like pay attention to your communication skills. Be patient. Continue to learn. Continue to grow. Continue to practice. Enhancing your communication skills is the fastest way for you to increase your profit. Yeah, I, that's a great, I love that, that you boiled it down to that 4% specifically, but also communication skills. There's such the importance to be able to practice and to hone that skill of communication. Absolutely. And I think we, we somehow gloss over it because everybody knows how to talk. But really great communication is not so much like just talking. The metaphor that I use is talking is like walking. Everybody can talk. Everybody can walk. But on the other hand, most of us don't know how to be a professional ballroom dancer. When you watch ballroom dancers, you know that it's choreographed. You know that they've practiced. You know they've put hours and hours of work into making it look effortless. And it's like that with great communication skills. When an entrepreneur is pitching to raise capital for his business or her business, they need to have put as much effort into it as that ballroom dancer. A lot of effort at the front end so that when the pitch is delivered, it looks effortless. And yet it's choreographed and it's a beautiful thing. So this is what I invite us all to. It's, it's my life passion. I'm still learning how to be a better communicator. And I find it endlessly fascinating. And telling stories is one of the main ways that people will remember you and remember what you have shared and remember how you made them feel. I've had so many people repeat stories that I've told them because the story really touched them. So we haven't talked too much about stories in this particular uh, podcast episode, but it's something that will help you bust through whatever obstacles you may be having in your business or personal life. Yes, we have not. Um, and I know that's a huge, that's a, an area that helps to build that authentic message, right? In reference to telling stories. So maybe you will have to come back and uh, we can dive into that topic in another time. That sounds good. <laughs> a storytelling episode. Exactly. Specifically. Um, how about what does the future hold for you? Any special projects that you're working on? I am having so much fun helping my clients write their nonfiction books, typically. 
I am helping a couple of clients with their fiction books, and I'm working on a fantasy series myself, but we'll have to save me revealing that till it's a little bit closer to publication. That, that'll that be coming out next year. I, I'm really excited about helping people really contribute their gifts to the world and create lasting legacy assets like books. I mean, a, a book is so amazing. It's like telepathy that can time travel. So now while you have the energy to listen to podcasts and share your message, why not write that book that will tell your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren who you are and what you care about and will have the additional benefit of helping you get really clear so that you will be clear, concise, and compelling when you're talking about whatever it is that you do. Wow. I really love that that tip and definitely appreciate all your time and effort and strategies that you've shared um, with our audience today. Well, thank you so much, Warren. I appreciate the opportunity to contribute to your listeners. And if people would like to know more, they can go wherever books are sold and they can get uh, Marketing Fast Track, the little book that launched a new business, which is a short little book that shows you how you can create a lead magnet, or they can get a much longer book, more in-depth book called Turn Words into Wealth, Blueprint for Your Business Brand and Book. If they'd like to connect with me, I'm, um, I'm on LinkedIn and my website is just my name, which is Aurora winter.com. A-U-R-O-R-A-W-I-N-T-E-R. Perfect. And I'll make sure both of those links uh, are in the website. So your LinkedIn and as well as your website. Thank you, Warren. Really a pleasure to connect with you. All right. Well, thank you for again for sharing your strategies, tips, and resources, helping our leaders to break through their obstacles and to achieve success. Well, until next time, this is your host, Warren Wandling saying, be resilient.